have there been architects that have not adjusted to the new reality? Yes, and there will always be some who have a bigger ego than they have rational thought. I don't think there are tens of thousands of brilliant designers. I believe there are a great many more good designers, though, than architects who are able to both design and execute. We very much enjoy working with architects. I think they have a tremendous future ahead, but they are going to have to acquire new skills, and they are going to have to demonstrate the ability to listen and to be more flexible. Architects, not unlike other professionals, come out of their professional schools, and they appear with no ears. They don't listen to people. I think there's definitely a feeling that architects are for the elite. I don't have many friends who would, who would consider hiring an architect to have their home built. People seem to think that architects are for the big guys. Well, some pointed comments there. Hello, welcome to Calgary and to the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's Festival of Architecture 1995. I'm Ann Petrie. Recently, I traveled to a number of cities and spoke to people in both Canada and the U.S. to talk about the state of the architectural profession today, about how architects can get their message out to the public, and about new directions that architects might explore to expand the scope of their practice. First of all, we're going to give you a report card. It may not be a report card you want to take home to your parents, but here's how others see you, good and bad. Let's meet the people who will be marking you. They are, from the developers, David Podmore, President and CEO of Greystone Properties Limited, one of the major developers of multifamily residential projects in Western Canada. Jonathan Weiner, Chairman of Candarel of Montreal, a developer of commercial real estate in Canada. And Gerald Hines, Chairman of the company Hines, an international real estate firm based in Houston, Texas. He has hired some of the top names in the profession today. From the government sector, Ellie Petraki, Senior Project Manager, and Victor Marco, Manager of Architecture and Engineering Services, both working for the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, and responsible for the development of Canadian consulates overseas. And Don Johnston, Director of the Housing Innovation Division for the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation in Ottawa. We'll hear from patrons of architecture, Phyllis Lambert, an architect herself, and someone who is well known to you all as the founder and director of the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. And Judge Ron Bell, a patron of the arts who has hired architects to design his own residences and who has been on selection committees for major public buildings. From the media, Marisa Patterson, editor of Award Magazine, which covers architecture, interior design, construction, and landscape architecture. And a pioneering architect who is well known to you all for his designs of the Hyatt Regency Hotels, and also as a developer and property manager, John Portman, chairman and CEO of the Portman Companies in Atlanta, Georgia. Here they are. There are some wonderful architects who have tremendous design capability. Um, they, on paper, there's a very pretty picture. Um, uh, everybody's enchanted by the design, but they really don't have any concept or control of cost. Um, they also don't necessarily have the ability to complete the technical drawings to perform to a budget. We don't select by the firm. More important to us than anything else is the experience and capability of the individual within the firm that will be specifically assigned to our project. And in fact, if there is a frustration with architects, it's the, to the extent that we aren't given service by the individual that we initially select, and where there isn't continuity through the process of design. And uh, that, I think, is, is a weakness in many firms that we find that we're switched from individual to individual that may not have the specific skills that we initially commissioned. I don't feel in the United States that they ha are held in disrespect. Maybe in Canada because there hasn't been that team approach as much as there has been in the United States that's been developed. We've built a lot more buildings here and that's why 
maybe the team approach has, where there's a knowledgeable, de knowledgeable developer with a knowledgeable architect and a knowledgeable client. The person who is going to build uh, well, it's just like uh, the client who, who goes to his doctor or his surgeon. What they want is confidence. They don't want uh, uh, to be nervous about the situation. And I think uh, for uh, the last 10 years at least, the architectural profession has confused the public. And one of the reasons that this confusion has occurred is because the media, in its desire to create novelty and to attract attention, uh, emphasizes things that scares the hell out of the client because they look so damn impractical. My experience with architects has been stimulating, provocative, and ultimately good. The most negative experience I had was uh, the inability or reluctance of an architect to abandon this project to me, he wanting to keep it to himself. Architects sometimes want to put their own signature on things that other people are paying for. But my overall experience has been one of sensitivity and, and production, and I've enjoyed working with them perhaps because of my own sensitivity to the art. My own experience is in the residential field, um, and so if we look at uh, a report card for architects, I think one thing that would jump forward would be that many of our buildings are suffering technical difficulties far too early in the process. And so we're seeing hundreds of millions of dollars of problems emerging in multiple housing projects. Um, and when we look at the drawings to find out what was the detail that led to this problem, we find no detail, um, that uh, the drawings are incomplete. Um, and so the problem was left to some workmen to solve uh, on a scaffold up 20 stories. Um, and as a result, uh, buildings are falling apart and we're going to have to spend a lot of money to fix them. In every, in every field, there are dogs, there are butchers, and there are um, the artistes of the, the premier class, uh, the first class architects. Um, yes, there are architects who are absolute slobs. Yes, there are architects who have no concept of uh, cost control. Uh, there are some architects who have no concept of design execution. As I said earlier, they can draw the picture, but they can't get it on paper to work. Or architects who have a brilliant design mind who have to wait till it's up and say, tear it apart, it doesn't look like I intended it to, because they really didn't work it out in the drawings. Um, and then there's the architects who can execute well and can't draw or design. I think for the most part architects are uh, financially responsible. Uh, we're finding more and more the architects that we meet uh, are gaining an understanding of the economics and the importance of controlling cost and projects. But there's certainly a long ways to go. Uh, I find Canadian architects excellent at the design and technology level. And uh, there are really no setbacks. I, working with them has been always very fruitful, very positive. And uh, I can't look back and say I've had problems with a certain architect or another one. And uh, knowing that the projects we have cooperated on are always projects of the Crown overseas, they always raise to the challenge and deliver excellent projects. I can't see the fact right, that, that people say that in Canada, our architects are not respected. I don't know what level people are talking uh, about, because certainly architects are respected. But you know what? You have to demand that respect. You have to cre create that respect. You can't just say, I'm an architect, therefore, ergo, you respect me. And you have to be able to show uh, on what level your concerns are and how you can relate to the public and to, 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 to your clients uh, to, to, to be respected. We still do encounter, uh, as unpopular as it will be to say, a, a certain arrogance amongst some architects. And I can certainly uh, tell you that we've had some real uh, problems in the last few years where we've had to patch or repair relations with communities or other groups. 
uh, where the architect hasn't shown the sensitivity that they should or hasn't had the communication skills uh, that they should have had uh, to work with the community, to work with public approving agencies and so on. We've received proposals that uh, restate our problem back to us uh, and little else. Uh, we've had architects uh, make proposals that ignore uh, what we are after and tell us what we really need and what we really want and how, why they should do it for us. Um, and uh, more often than not, w there's a reason for what we want and we know what we want. And um, architects, if they'd like to increase their chances of getting that work, would do well to think about what it is we're asking for and show us uh, that they're the people who are best able to provide that service. I think that today we have um, a better balance. If I look back 20, 30 years ago, and that's not to say there aren't any left today, but there were many, many architects who were prima donnas that said, if we do not get to control the project, I'm off, I'm the boss. If I don't get the design that I want, I walk. I don't think that's realistic. It may be in certain environments where the budget is absolutely open, but I don't think that's realistic either at government levels anymore. Uh, because government purses aren't as open as they are, whether it be for cultural or other issues, um, or commercial. I have only, I have never actually personally been associated with a project where a corporation said to me, money is no object. I would love the opportunity as much as any architect would, but I don't think that's realistic. I don't think that the public's attitude towards architecture has changed. I think when the, ar when the community is shown what really good architecture can mean to the community, uh, the community responds. And uh, we've seen good examples of that in our own city in Vancouver, most recent being the, uh, the new public library. You know, the process of selection was initially criticized, but I think it's pretty hard in this community now not to find a member of the public that's really excited about the architecture of, of that new building. And on a very much smaller scale, we find in our own projects where architects work really well with the community, or with the approving authorities and ourselves, uh, we, get a, we get a strong response from the community that's extremely supportive. When Canadian architects uh, build for us uh, overseas, uh, they tend to uh, over-elaborate based on their knowledge. They carry their designs to the, very, to the nth degree, you might say. And uh, when it comes time to have it constructed, and now all of the drawings are, are accurate, they're as we would do it here, and they have uh, followed all of our codes, and, uh, and yet when it gets to a foreign contractor, they get a set of, a uh, complete set of, of drawings that are, are perfectly done by Canadian, by Canadian architecture firm, and they don't see it that way. And therein, they can't construct it that way. If you look at the architectural uh, periodicals, etc., there's a lot of press given to uh, um, aesthetics uh, of, uh, of an elite nature. And certainly um, these push us forward and uh, there is interest between architects in that. But um, there's a suspicion that, uh, uh, particularly amongst uh, builders and others, that this is um, not so much in the interests of the, of the client and uh, more in, in the interest of impressing each other. Canada, like many other countries, is, is still a little provincial. And I don't mean small countries. I mean countries in Europe where this process has not been developed, where they have architectural competitions, where they'll have eight or ten architects competing without the input of the developer, and they have some very severe cost problems and practical problems. Uh, and it has not been developed to the same level that's been developed in the United States because of this last boom in the 80s. We built a lot of square footage and we honed our process very, very well. And you don't have that in Europe or in Canada as a fact. Yes, I think some architects are too passive. They feel threatened that if they take a position, obviously they will affect the the completion date of the project or the the approval of the project at City Hall uh, using the adage you can't fight City Hall but an architect just as a developer cannot fight City Hall architects as an association 
developers, and I formed the Urban Development Institute of Canada for Quebec. Developers through an association can fight City Hall. One cannot. But as a group, you can hide behind the group. You can make an issue as a group. And you can make a difference as a group. Architecture used to be one of the big three professions, along with medicine and, and law. I don't know if people really consider architecture up there with medicine and law anymore. And I think architects really have to think long and hard about why. Where have they gone wrong? Why doesn't the public see architecture as one of, one of the professions to be looked up to and admired and respected? The architect is, or can be, and perhaps should be the agent of the spirit and the soul. Who else in our society is trained to do that? As this session continues, our video participants will tell us what they feel the role of the architect is or should be. Some comments from the people we saw in the previous segment, as well as from William Thorsell, Editor-in-Chief of Canada's national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. And Paul Goldberger, Chief Cultural Correspondent and Architectural Critic for The New York Times. Here's what they had to say. Do I think that the architect's role has changed? Absolutely. Uh, when I first started in the business, the architect was king. He dictated what structural engineer, what mechanical, and they saluted every time they came in his office and they, he would listen to no feedback. If he wanted an 11-foot floor and it was more practical to do a 13-foot floor, he got an 11-foot floor. Now, today, we hire our mechanical engineers, structural and mechanicals, and put them under the architect, but they speak to us around the meetings and everything is on top of the table. They don't have to worry about being fired by the architect because we're the one that hired him. So we get frank discussions. Nothing's buried. We don't see the architect as the Renaissance man. We do see him as the maestro. We think he's important to help us choreograph a project. But he's got to be a listener. He, uh, he or she has to be uh, capable of taking in our needs and interpreting them we hope, in an inspirational manner. But above all else, has to be a team player, has to be sensitive to finance and to the costs of the project, and has to be sensitive to our timelines. I think that I want that person also to be able to understand the aspirations that we have, and to somehow, when the, when the work is done, that the work itself enhances those aspirations functionally and expresses those aspirations symbolically and says something about our identity to ourselves as well as to other people. So I want them to solve problems and make sure that certain things can work well, functionally and so forth. But I want meaning and I want aspirations and meaning to be on show, meaning relative to this particular work, whether it's my home or my new newspaper building. The architect has to take or interpret as part of his design process social function, social needs, the inner city, the suburban environment, its future and its past, its neighbors, respectful of buildings that surround it, respectful of the pedestrian on the street, and frankly, very respectful of the people who are going to be its very users. We found that good architecture is good business because good business means a, an occupancy in a building that creates pride in the employees, pride in the city, of the city for that building. And I think that architects have a great responsibility to move with the trends and to build a better built environment. If architects are doing their job well, they're understanding the societal pressures being placed on people every day. For example, if an architect has a specialty in housing, that architect must understand the social pressures being placed on the family, single family, single parent families, um, 
dual income families and so on. Architects do have to have a good understanding of societal issues. They can't just be designers. I think the role of the architect is to take an inventory of need from a client and to have a feel for what that client wants. For example, when this house was under design, I had my, uh, or before the design actually, or the beginning of the design process, I had the feeling that uh, the architect knew me well enough just to do it. I want the architect to take over and present something to me that says, this is you, this incorporates what you said you wanted, and it has, I think, good design. Now let's talk about that. Then the dialogue starts. That's, that's how I think the process should work. As we look at cost, utilization, and practicality, we're looking for the architects for ideas. They throw the pitches, and we rule whether they're strikes or balls. There's so many questions to be asked about uh, where the site is to be, or if that's already chosen, what the impact is to be, what the uh, person who's building that uh, building yeah. believes that the impact it'll have on the people around it, the city, the people who work there. I mean, these are the questions that the architect has to bring out of the client to make the client think. No, I don't see the architect as a project manager. Um, we're a very much a hands-on client and we see the architect as one branch, basically, or one hand uh, in our operation um, with the particular task of coordinating the design function. Uh, in terms of project management, which to me means on-site management, supervision of construction, preparation of budgets, cost control, he's a participant, but he's not taking the lead. I, I beg to disagree. I think more than ever, the architect will be the team leader. And because of his background and because of his knowledge of all those little of all those components he can keep the team together and guarantee the result the architect on our team is the most senior member of the design team uh, in other words uh, the electrical mechanical structural engineers um, are an important member of the team each of them but the architect to us is the lead, is the lead with respect to um, the design development, the sizing and, and, and the direction that we take and he's the major coordinator. So he is still maintaining the role that he, ha he or she had many, many years ago of being the number one member of the team. But today they are dealing with not the architect alone, it's the architect and the owner and potentially the contractor all at the table, and they are perhaps equals, working through the process together. We don't look to them to uh, cost the project, we don't look to them to prepare uh, budgets, and we don't see the architect as an active participant in the on-site uh, supervision of the project. The good old days when the architect was the master builder, you might say, or uh, would have uh, generated a great deal of respect in society, in a neighborhood, it doesn't, it's not there now. And why isn't it there? During the time when they perhaps were busy doing uh, Canadian work, for instance, there was uh, entrepreneurship of going on just beneath their, their nose. And these were people that were not architects. They were people that were uh, coming to clients and saying, look, we can do it, we can get it for you wholesale. Oh yeah, we can pick up an architect or something. We'll get everything you want. And uh, there's been some very bad examples of what happened in that case. But they lost, the, the architects lost a lot of the ground. Architecture is an art. It is the art of how one makes cities. It is the art of how one makes people accommodation for the highest sense of well-being. That's what architecture is. I think architects should be involved in any public issue that involves the physical form of a community any public issue that involves the physical form of a town, of a village, of a city. We're increasingly operating with the realization, and I think it's a correct realization, that there is a public role to even the most private building, and therefore 
a government has a right to at least some say over the form of that building. And the whole process by which that's reviewed and discussed is one in which architects should absolutely be involved. I think the word is responsibility. I think the architect has to broaden not only his scope of knowledge, but his perception, uh, the public perception of his scope of responsibility. You see, the architect loses all, resp all respect. He loses uh, 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 the thing that he needs the most, and that is confidence from the client when he produces something that's either impractical, it doesn't work, it costs too much, it takes too long, he can't do that. I think architects uh, in the future would benefit greatly from working in the, by working in the construction field for a period of time, understanding firsthand the problems that can be encountered both in a cost and schedule uh, sense uh, but also in the actual physical construction program. Um, I think they could also benefit much greatly by a real exposure to the economics of construction and development. By door working with contractors. You bring the contractor in as part of your team, and you, uh, you, you discuss with the contractor. You, you go and see what the process. You don't decide how the materials, especially if you're using them in a new way, ought to be uh, made. You go and see how they manufacture them. Ask them the why they do them. Ask them if they could do it some other different way. Suggest to them how it could be done. It, it, it's always this kind of, it's always a give and take with a contractor. Contractors are wonderful to work with. My primary interest has been, and always has been, in design, in how what we do really affects the context in which it sits, and how it makes a contribution, not only to the project, but to society in the past, present, and future. Well, and that's my training. That's an architectural training. I don't think anybody else thinks that way. We need creative people. I'm an engineer. I'm not a designer. But I'm a, cr I'm a critic, and I can tell whether it's, it's practical or not, and so do our people. So I think there's an ever greater challenge for good design because we want to build a better built environment to create a better social fabric for our cities and I hope it can be for Nova Scotia where my parents were born. I don't think people think so negatively of architects. I think the problem is they often just don't think of architects at all. The public doesn't think of architects at all. Do you agree with Paul Goldberger? Is that how architects want it? In this session, we'll be looking at how you are seen by the public, as well as ways to make sure that they think positively about you. The first thing we want to find out is what kind of image and role architects had in the past and how that affects the way they are seen today. We'll be hearing from two people whose writing on architecture will be familiar to all of you. Vincent Scully, Professor Emeritus at Yale University, who lectures on the history of art and architecture and who is a well-known critic of the contemporary scene. And the man we just heard from, Paul Goldberger of the New York Times. The question of whether the public has respect for architects and respect for architecture 
is one that I think the profession's been grappling with for a long time. I don't know that the profession has ever had the high esteem that it, it seeks, that it deserves, that it ought to have. Uh, there's always been a sense that architecture has been somewhat marginal to the ongoing life of society. On the other hand, architects have, have escaped the real wrath that society brings down toward lawyers, say. I think it's very intelligent and perceptive that they feel that the public is a little disenchanted with architecture or with architects. And I think there's a very good reason for that. I think that in the period of high modernism, which is still alive and among many architects, the architect regarded himself as a kind of epic hero who was going to remake the world on his own terms. And out of those ideas came, of course, the, the frightful city planning ideas of American redevelopment, of uh, throughways tearing our cities apart, all deriving from the uh, visions of Le Corbusier and Hilbersheimer. Because wanting to be free, to be totally free, to be free as a painter, and specifically as an abstract painter, the architect came to despise everything which would limit that freedom. And those limitations mainly were the realities of the urban situation, the reality of cities, the whole structure of the city, which is, in, in fact, the, the proudest development of Western architecture, is the slow, wonderful development of streets, sidewalks, sidewalk planting, houses on plots, streets, squares. This is the basic structure, the urban structure, which is the environment in which we lived our lives. The architect, the high modern architect, uh, of the period directly after World War II. But still alive, this attitude, in, in many architects' minds, the architect saw himself as having a mission to outrage all that, that that whole urban fabric, that whole traditional fabric was worth nothing and was, in, in fact, a, a meretricious growth. There was never a perfect age. There was never a golden age. But yes, there were ages when things were better. I think the late 19th century, the first couple of decades of the 20th century were all such time, uh, but we paid a price for them. We built a very noble and wonderful public realm in those days. Those were the years when, particularly in the United States, but to some extent in Canada too, the public infrastructure was built very nobly. We built great museums, great parks, great civic centers, all done as people's palaces, in effect, and done very beautifully and very well the same city of New York that built Central Park, the New York Public Library, Grand Central Terminal, Pennsylvania Station, many other great buildings, also was full of rotten, decrepit tenements that were even significantly worse than the kind of housing we have today. So we have picked up a little bit on social responsibility, not a lot, but a little bit at least, but we've lost something in the larger sense. Uh, is it possible to have both? I don't see why it can't be. Uh, we're in a society today in which the rich have gotten even richer than they were before. The gap between rich and poor is larger than it was before. Uh, and yet, the riches are not going to enhance the public realm as they did once before. The riches are going to enhance the private realm. And we really need a sense of return to the whole notion of architecture as a way of enriching the public realm as it once was. I think as soon as the public saw what redevelopment did, I think as soon as the public recognized how architects were not interesting themselves at all in historic preservation, in the basic uh, salvation of the structure of our cities, public began to turn against architecture. And I, I think by the 70s, 80s maybe, uh, there was a general perception on the part of the public that it was better to save a building in a city because the building you were going to get in return was probably going to be much worse. You know, one of, the, one of the real sicknesses of the modern age, and it's worked in modern politics as well as in uh, modern architecture, has the sense that you, this our age, is special and has to invent a, a style for itself. And out of that comes reductionism or monsters. And really, that's what we've done. You, know, you see, some of our very best work has been work that, that 
one single man could invent and control. Mies is the very best example. If a man is going to invent a style and do it all himself, clearly it's not going to be as rich, as complicated, as varied, as resonant as a style that's grown up of the, out of the work of many, many people who are working together. Mies took classicism and he reduced it to what he could handle. And in a sense, his work is flawless from that point of view. But as Venturi said, basically, not enough. Not enough. Not enough urbanistically. Not enough in terms of the relationships that are necessary for things to relate to each other to make communities. Architects are marginal to society because society is not concerned enough about the state of the built environment, about the physical world in which we live, and the way in which it can be made better. And I think architects have not done a good enough job in making society at large understand that they hold a lot of the keys to making it better. That's Paul Goldberger's take on how well the architectural profession is communicating its role to society at the present time. It's a vital question, and we'll hear again from Paul Goldberger, as well as from Jim Taggart, Director of Communications at the Architectural Institute of British Columbia, Marisa Patterson, editor of Award Magazine, and William Thorsell of the Globe and Mail newspaper. People don't see architects as much anymore. Architects are, in a way, hiding behind their buildings or blending into the woodwork. Um, they, we don't have the names that we used to. We don't have a Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, we don't have names that the public can recognize as, yeah, I know that person as an architect. I, I, my friends are, by and large, educated people. And I don't know if they could name one architect in Vancouver, except for perhaps Arthur Erickson. People don't know who the architects are. Architects are hiding somewhere. The star system in and of itself is also a danger because it does create a sense that architecture is only a matter of a few celebrities doing their buildings and getting into the magazines. And in fact, the reality of architecture is much more in its potential to affect the quality of life in an everyday way. I'm, I'm more concerned, certainly, with the ambience of streets and cities and communities and what kind of housing we can build than I am with the latest thing by an architectural star, sexy as it may appear to be. Uh, I'm only raising the star stuff because it does have a way of, of juicing up the whole architectural culture and the public culture and reminding people of the role architecture can play in, in society at large. As an architect, I, I think there's a spiritual and uplifting um, component to architecture. And to walk into a grand space in Vancouver, such as Ericsson's Courthouse, is to me still a very uplifting experience. I think what is difficult is that a lot of people don't understand why that is so. While people seem quite confident discussing harmony and rhythm and proportion and so forth in music, they seem far less so when it comes to architecture. And I feel that one of the duties that we have as a profession is to try and be part of that education process. And at the AIBC, of course, we have got an Architects in Schools program. We also have the Public Walking Tours program, both of which are attempting to translate the beauty of architecture uh, into layman's language. I think architects have to reach out more to the public, have to get in the media more, have to make the media know that they are available, um, to comment on various issues to do with development and design. Quite often, um, when I see a news report about a housing development, for example, going on in the Lower Mainland, or a, a new, new interesting structure, it's the developer who's, who's interviewed, or the contractor. Often the architect is left out. Um, by the same token, in consumer magazines, often in a story about a beautiful home, the interior designer is, is interviewed, but not the architect. Why is that? Is our architects perhaps not making it clear to the media that they're available for comment? Um, I think they have to let the media know what their areas of expertise are. I think a lot of journalists don't know. Um, and they have to make journalists aware that they're available for comment. I've often found in the past uh, real frustration with architects and the media. 
and it has to do with the profession of architecture, and it's like doctors and lawyers. Apparently, they're not allowed to talk about each other. So if you say to an architect, we'd like you to write an op-ed page piece about something where another architect's work is involved, where there might be some critical comment or something, um, they, they won't. They'll be disciplined by their profession for breaking ranks and saying things and uh, so forth. I think if, if the association is not allowing architects to speak up about the built environment, then the association has to relook at things. Um, I think one of the reasons that architecture as a profession is not well understood by the public is the public doesn't hear from architects. Architects aren't, aren't interviewed on television a lot. In, architects don't often show up in magazine articles, except in trade magazines. Um, the public doesn't really know what architects are about, I don't think. Um, I think people need to understand what they do, what their areas of expertise are, and um, I think that will gain architects a great deal more respect from the public. We are now at a sort of second generation of our communications programs, perhaps even a third generation. Um, we have tried to start with the Vancouver Sun uh, project called House of the Month, where we try and feature an architect-designed house in the new home section once a month. Uh, we are having trouble in terms of uh, members submitting schemes to us, but we do have a very successful precedent just south of the border in Seattle where they've been running such a program for about 40 years. Um, what that kind of vehicle does for us is to, it does two things. Firstly, by focusing on houses that are not necessarily the $2 million waterfront mansions, we are helping the public to realize that the services of architects can be valuable on the kind of homes that they may be wanting to, to live in. Um, we're also, by uh, incorporating an open house tour with each of these projects, we're giving the public an opportunity to walk around uh, a piece of architecture in the company of an architect and to understand the role of the architect in that particular project. I think that's really very valuable. I think our readership, and partly because of the nature of our readership, which is uh, an interested readership in general in life and in culture, uh, certainly have responded very enthusiastically to our writing about design, architecture, fashion, cities, urban planning. And uh, we need to do more of it, and we are doing more of it as a result in part, and I think partly because of our own passion for it as well. Uh, so I, 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 think the, I think the field is more, uh, is richer these days for this field of architecture and architecture in relationship to city life. Um, I think that people are a little tired of the artifact alone kind of thing. They want to talk about architecture in the context of neighborhoods and cities and the broader social context. So if there are people in the profession who are more articulate and want to have things to say, I think they'll, be, they'll find an audience. What can architects do to raise their public profile? First, we'll hear from two critics who have opposing views about the future for architecture, but who each have something to say about getting involved publicly. We'll discuss criticism of architects' work. Does it help in educating and informing the public? Should architects be the ones to do it? And some ideas on education programs and communication strategies, ways to make the public aware of the importance of architects and architecture in the world of the future. Here's what our guests had to say. I would say that on the whole, the outlook for architecture is for all other aspects of civilization right now is grim. And I, I see that especially in, in an American context. I, I see that in terms of the, of the plight of the city at the present time. I see it in terms of uh, the sorrow and the racism that have torn our cities apart. The future of architecture, I think, is bright because we are an increasingly visually literate society. We care more about the way things look, and at the end of the day, that's going to have to be good for architecture. But in the short term, it's going to be tough because we're also a society under tremendous pressure right now, and too many people consider architecture a luxury and not an essential part of the quality of life.
architects can be good citizens too with their very special expertise, and they ought to be. They ought to be deeply involved in these issues. I mean, see, if the architect, it's very difficult for him. I understand that. He has to make a living. It's a fundamental thing. But, uh, you know, I mean, an architect really ought to tell people what Walmarts do to Main Street, for example, what they do to the towns around them. Architects have, can be listened to, will be listened to by people. Well, what the profession has to do is continue doing lobbying as hard as it possibly can to do good work and to have a public role. The architectural profession has to speak out on public issues. I think it has to happen at a local level as well as a national and provincial level. Uh, and the more architects are involved in public life in a larger sense, the more their specific abilities and, and world view will come to bear on the future of communities. There's a forum, indeed, uh, uh, for their participation. They can try to, uh, to testify. They can offer themselves to testify in the court cases that arise from these things. And uh, uh, there are, for example, there are a few people around this country right now who are making a small change by being assassins for developers and for towns who will hire themselves out to say that uh, this and that building, maybe nowhere near where they live, is of no Im historical importance at all and get paid for it. Uh, Architects should always be ready to speak out on the right side, on the side of what they know to be the truth, uh, like anyone else. It's not difficult. Unquestionably, architects do have to become more involved in public life and in the built environment and in the whole public dialogue. And to do that well is definitely going to have to require a willingness to talk about the reality of the built environment as it now is, which can sometimes mean saying, pretty nasty things about colleagues' work, or even maybe about their own, but also praising work where it's good, too. Sure, um, to be part of the public dialogue does require a fair amount of willingness to uh, be out there talking about it. I would like to see architects be more critical of architecture and the built environment. I know that raises touchy professional questions, However, I think that architects must, someone's got to be an advocate for the built environment. Architects, to me, are guardians of the built environment. They aren't just designers. Um, if, if they're not going to speak up and, and say, this is an inappropriate development, this is not the way you do housing, and so on, if they're not going to do it, who will? I think architects have to be more vocal. Architects uh, are not in the media because they tell you they can't go in the media. It's not proper for them to be uh, controversial or to even say, call things as they see them in the media. They'll get slapped down by their local professional peer group. So I think that, uh, you know, architects, we would like to see more architects engaged in some of the public debates over architecture and planning, and uh, yet uh, they are self-muzzled. So it's kind of hard for architects, I guess, to go to local papers and say, you know, find someone else to uh, to talk uh, uh, in an informed way about architecture because the editor tends to go back and say, well, what about you people? What about you coming out and writing letters and op-ed page pieces or a call once in a while and they all run for the cover and say, oh, no, no, we can't, we can't talk about uh, issues in architecture in public. Architects often don't want to talk about their colleagues' work. Uh, some do, some don't. Many don't because they feel it's professionally not the most responsible thing to do. Uh, I don't blame them. To some extent, that's right. Uh, I don't know that uh, internal bickering within a profession is necessarily of that much interest to the general public. And I think it's often true that outsiders can come with a much fresher and more objective view and are often more articulate. I mean, architects, if they're really good at what they do, should do that. I mean, architects' job is to make buildings, not necessarily to make commentary about buildings. And it's good to have people from another point of view who have studied how you look at a, a building critically. But I think it's also very useful for uh, architects to uh, discuss their uh, colleagues. And uh, I think it's essential. I think that you, know, you have to learn how to say things in a way that is not uh, 
offensive because you have to deal with issues. And if you can take those issues and take them out of necessarily say, okay, this presents this issue, but there are other buildings that have presented the same issue, and try, uh, you know, it, it takes a little bit of thought. And you can't just sit down and say, oh, I'm mad, or I can't stand it, and this is terrible. I mean, there has to be uh, some way of thinking it through where it can be put in a level that's, I think if you think about writing in a level that's instructive to people, uh, not getting your hate, venting your hate about a certain whatever, we all have those, but, uh, but let's say, okay, how can I make this generalized or uh, so people can understand the issues and um, in the future, uh, you know, so that you can educate the public? And I think that way uh, one, can, one can do it. Don't be afraid to come out and say what you think. And if you design a building, be proud of it. Send out press releases. Get in front of the public. Make people understand what architecture is and how valuable it is to their daily lives. Architects are the people who must, in some way, either in a corporate way or individually, start an educative process. I don't know whether they do it by forums, such as uh, some lawyers have done and accountants have done to present their trade in a better light. Maybe they do it by articles. Maybe they do it by television programs. Maybe they do it by radio programs. Maybe they visit schools. But if no one else is going to do the education, they must, and it would be a while before that pays off, but how exciting when someone builds a house that is designed by a competent designer, an architect, and they say, wow, I've got this. It's, it's enduring. It's lovely. We need to have the educative process at work. I think architects do in some ways feel that they're above media relations. Um, that maybe it's, it's bringing their profession down to want to get up in front of the TV cameras and say this project is inappropriate, this development is inappropriate, or whatever the subject may be. But I think architects have to try to get beyond that, have to remember how powerful, whether we like it or not, how powerful the media is. And I think architects haven't caught on to that the way other professions have. Architects have to realize the power of the media, have to get in front of the public and the way to do that, in a lot of ways, is through the media. What we would like to do is, is to put architecture on the street in the same way that art is on the street through art galleries or literature is on the street through libraries. Uh, we would like to have uh, the public become used to the idea of, of there being a resource uh, for them in the form of an architecture center where they can, they can come to look at the latest trends in design, they can come to to, to find a, a better understanding of uh, some of the things that are happening around them. And we may be in a position to put that in place within two or three years. It's absolutely essential to have uh, an education of the general public. I think that uh, there has to be architects that write uh, and other critics who write uh, for the newspapers. No, publishers are probably not going to wake up in the morning and say, wow, I've had a vision, and the vision begins with a capital A, and it's architecture. And in fact, architecture is, in the minds of many publishers, something of a luxury to cover. And at a time when the press is cutting back more and more, it's a tough sell. No question about it. It's not an easy, automatic thing. The argument, though, that has to be made is that we, as a, as a society, are becoming more and more visually literate. That's the upside. That's the good news, is that even if we're not always doing what we should, there's more concern about the way things look. People are at least marginally more sophisticated about design than they used to be. They seem to pay more attention to what things look like. And we've seen a tremendous upsurge in the level of the design of consumer objects, say from where they were just 10 years ago in this country. Start, if you want, with homes in the cocooning 90s, and then get on to public institutions and schools and buildings and shopping malls and strip malls and gas stations. Uh, I think there would be a great appetite for that. But again, you need, to you need to be able to find the sponsorship for it, I suppose. And you need to be able to find people in the architectural community, or I guess others, uh, who can who can speak intelligently about these things and make them, 
make them understandable and comprehensible to an, a wider audience. Cover design more thoroughly. Cover the way things look. And knowing that people care about the way things look or they wouldn't be buying better stuff today than they used to be. And go from there sort of toward bigger and bigger things. Start with spoons, move to buildings, go to cities. Um, I mean, evaluating, critiquing, discussing, writing about, reporting on every level of the man-made environment from a spoon to a chair to clothing to a house to a street to a whole city or village or town. Our Architects in Schools program is not so much a program about what architects do or how to become an architect. It's not a careers-oriented program. Rather, what we are doing is focusing on the built environment. We are working within the confines of the existing BC curriculum. And we are trying to educate and ultimately to empower children uh, by giving them an understanding of the processes that shape and form the built environment. These processes are physical. These processes are political. What we would like to see is 20 years from now a generation of graduates who are able to stand up in public meetings and to speak eloquently on behalf of their neighborhood and their community. And now let's have a final word from Judge Ron Bell. Architects somehow have, be, uh, have got to learn to infest our community so that their skills are observed so that their talents can be used. And I, I, I wish them luck. And I want to say to people who have had the feeling that architects are a group aside and out there, that that is not so. Perhaps you are. Perhaps you need to know an architect. Well, I think that the architects are really are going to have to look at, at the field in which they practice at the present time, and they will have to make choices. Um, they will have to make choices of what they want to do. They can continue to practice the traditional kind of architectural work that they've been doing now for a very significant period of time, but to a great degree face a shrinking traditional market. That was George Seaton, Director General of the Institute for Research and Construction in Ottawa, reminding us of what appears to be a very harsh economic reality today. In listening to the comments for this session, it might be useful to remember that the Chinese character for crisis is made up of the characters for danger and opportunity. Is architecture in a crisis? If it is, is the profession at a danger point? Or are things changing in such a way that there are new opportunities opening up to architects? We're going to hear from a number of people giving their opinions on what we are calling emerging opportunities. First, the controversial issue of design build. We'll hear from Jonathan Weiner of Candarell in Montreal, John Portman of the Portman Companies in Atlanta, Georgia, David Podmore of Greystone Properties Limited in Vancouver, and from Gerald Hines of the corporation simply called Hines in Houston, Texas. On the role and the importance of computerization in architectural practice, we'll hear from George Seaton and Jonathan Weiner. Social and cultural changes in Canada are presenting new opportunities for architects, but they also require perhaps a new way of approaching the process. I spoke with Marie Odile Marceau a project manager with Marceau Evans in Vancouver, 
who has many years' experience in working with First Nations communities. And we'll see some footage of the Seabird Island School built for a native band in the Fraser Valley. Some architects say that Canada is overbuilt, and that explains the slowdown in new commercial developments. But what about the buildings that are already standing and starting to age? To look at the opportunities that they present, we'll hear again from George Seaton and from Don Johnston of the Canada Housing and Mortgage Corporation in Ottawa. And finally, Ellie Petraki of the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade will join Jonathan Weiner and John Portman in a look at the markets that are opening up overseas. Following the video, there will be workshops focusing specifically on design build, the environment, and computerization. But first, here's what our guests had to say. Uh, there will always be a future for architects. How, how wide and, uh, and the breadth of that future depends on the profession. And I think if the architect uh, tends to create the perception of irresponsibility, a lack of credibility, and so the client, out of fear, brings in cost control management, brings in a whole team of people to ride herd on him, uh, you know, that's raising a whole, a lot of flags that, it, that the architect is really doesn't know what he's doing and he's got to have someone to, to straighten him out. And that is, that's a sad commentary on our profession. But unfortunately, uh, that's the perception that seems to exist out there and that's why you have design-build. We like the design-build approach. We like to... Uh work with the architect to refine our plans, to uh, uh, give the architect feedback. We do our own internal costing and we'll give him feedback and explain where we have to make changes, or alterations or cuts, and look to the architect to help us find some solutions that will achieve our goals. I think there's a lot of pitfalls in it because a lot of times the contractor is submissive to the architect and because the architect brought him in and you don't get that tension of equals and it's the tension of equals where a developer is on an equal status and then employs a contractor who is responsible to both the architect and the, and the developer. That is where you get the best quality of tension. So when one is submissive and the other is dominant, you don't get the correct relationship. I don't think the architect loses by design build. I think it depends on the architect. It's a question of how the architect manages the process. Um, there's a wonderful book on uh, out that uh, was written that's called If It Isn't Broken, Break It. Um, the architects can't get away with the age-old arrogance of an architect of 30, 40 years ago because they were the process. They ran it, they called all the shots, and that was it. It's my way or the highway. They can still manage the process, but there are things that have changed. And the things that they have changed that they must adapt to is there's another member or two of the team at the table. That's a positive, not a negative. The positive is that they can maintain quality of control of design within the context of budget. Not design and find out it's out of budget and then have to redesign. I think it's, uh, it's a cop-out. I mean, because in design build, when you bring uh, a builder uh, and the client and uh, the architect together simultaneously uh, from the very beginning, you know, you don't write music that way. The, the role of computers in architecture is a very important role. Um, that role, incidentally, is now being explored in, in many other professions and, and many other processes. It's, it's a role which allows architects to simulate construction process. You can build a building, a virtual building, 
on computer. You can try out any number of schemes. You can model. You can examine it in three dimensions. And the other issue that's made the architect far more efficient, and they need less staff, and they're able to show the client much more, is the computer. The computer has allowed us to look at a, what, a lot of what ifs. What if we do this? What if we do that? What is it going to look like? And be able to look at the finished product in minutes or hours instead of weeks and months. Surely the architects have adapted to the computer, and those that haven't will be left behind. Given the capability of electronic communications, you can have consortia that consist of a number of small firms that essentially deliver the product to their clients as if they were one large firm. That's the wonder of communication, that you can simultaneously work in different places, in fact, different cities, different countries. And as far as the customer is concerned, he doesn't know the difference. There is a fair amount of opportunities for architect in the, in the uh, uh, with regards to um, work on First Nations reserves, on First Nations communities. First Nations communities are in expansion, are in great in expansion, and First Nations will need architects in the future, uh, do need architects now. Uh, and um, for architects, I think, to be considered, um, they will have to show open-mindedness uh, towards the desires, philosophy, and culture of First Nations, understanding that uh, there are uh, 520 First Nations in Canada, and they're all different. I had observed that buildings on Indian reserves were not often respected and were being the victims of the act of vandalism, that's what we call today, but I felt that it was a lack of respect, a lack of, of love for buildings. And I felt that that was obvious. If people felt that they had absolutely no connection with the facility, why would they respect them? Why would they like that, that facility? And that was really the prime objective, was to instill a sense of pride, ownership, and respect towards a facility, was to ensure that the facility that they would get, they would feel it's theirs. I felt to accomplish that, the only way was to intimately involve the community in the process of designing and constructing the building. It's very important because if it does not reflect these people, they will not like it. And a building that is not liked is a building that does not have a soul. But I think I see a love for that uh, building every time I go into it. People are extremely uh, proud of it. Of course, it helps when you're being told that the building in which you, you, you uh, school your children is an award-winning building. But uh, it goes beyond that. They love that building. Well, um, looking for new opportunities uh, for architects. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are perhaps fewer new buildings, but more and more older buildings um, around, uh, many of which are in premature difficulty because they were poorly built the first time. Um, as a client, um, often we uh, look to building science uh, organizations rather than going to architectural offices uh, to deal with not only the research, but also repairing some of these buildings. The picture is very exciting. Um, there is some two trillion dollars worth of existing buildings in this country that needs to be adapted and adopted for today's environments. They need to be made productive. They need to be made more comfortable. And the major challenge for architects is to really look at the existing stock and to, and to make it very, very productive. Now, that's a major challenge, and it's right there. Um, some 50% of construction dollar now is being spent on renovation and rehab. In those firms, uh, engineering firms, building science firms, there are architects um, playing vital roles of uh, participating in, in all the functions of those offices, even though they're not classical 
uh, architectural offices. So I think there's a whole area of building science um, uh, and dealing with problem projects and the repair of projects uh, where architects can find uh, expanded roles to play. Architects are beginning to learn how to make the environment very comfortable and very suitable through the integration of acoustics and lighting and space separation and heating and air conditioning and ventilation and so on. And it's one big mass which is called indoor environment. Even though there, are, there is less and less new social housing being constructed, there still are 650,000 social housing units out there, all of which is getting older. Um, so not only are there technical and managerial uh, challenges to dealing with that housing stock, but there are the social dimensions of dealing with the existing neighborhoods. Um, uh, unlike new construction, your clients are right there in front of you. And uh, architects can play a role in community animation, in dealing with uh, these existing communities, building trust with them, uh, helping to find solutions with, uh, with the current uh, users of those buildings. Um, and as our housing stock ages, the, there'll be more and more of these issues to face. That's a major job, make those buildings much more energy efficient. And Canada is one of the international leaders in this field, and we, in fact, export that technology. And the architects have not run out of work. There is a tremendous amount of work. But it's going to be a somewhat different work from the one that they have had for the past 40 or 50 years. With respect to architects doing work overseas, I think probably one of the most fabulous things we have in Canada is a tremendous international respect for our ability as builders. And that, when I say as builders, I include our architects and our engineers and our developers and contractors. I think the design built uh, is a way of the future, but I'm seeing it also as something for opening new fields and entering the international market. The, an architect or an architectural practice, it's very difficult for them to pierce into the international market because it's so expensive. But a contractor or a developer can pierce and can investigate and can go and grab contracts all over the world. And then the architect can team up I think uh, the next uh, 10 years in the United States is going to be slow. Uh, I think uh, the next, uh, I think Mexico, once it gets over this currency situation, is going to offer a, a, a lot of opportunity. I think South America is going to offer a lot of opportunity as well as, as Eastern Europe. Uh, we have been exploring all of those markets, and that's where the future is for the next 10 to 20 years. We have a great deal going for us and a tremendous amount of respect in the international markets. And I can only encourage the architects to really get out there, get on a plane, and get to South America or to China or to the FSU countries or to Russia. That is where the action is. It's unfortunate, but North America is mature relative to those environments. What we've seen is since 1950s, a phenomenal growth of, of constru in construction and residential and commercial requirements in the North American environment. Well, all these other nations have awakened now, and they're going through that growth. And that's where those opportunities are. Well, that's it from our video guests. The architectural profession is certainly at an interesting point in its evolution. I, for one, will be watching to see where it all goes from here. We hope that these comments will help you in advocating architecture and architects. Good luck. <laughs>